Welcome, everyone. I'm sure a lot of you are still logging on right now, but I thought I would uh, get started uh, on this lovely November morning, where we are anyway. Um, welcome you all to the Plastics Research in Action second year update. My name is Lorraine Royer, Director of Government and Stakeholder Relations with Interpipeline, and I will be your host for today's event. Before we get started, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kenai, Pekani, the Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and the Métis, region, Métis Nation Region 3, and all people who make their homes in Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Uh, two years ago, we announced the Plastic Research and Action Partnership with NATE to develop solutions to ensure that pla waste plastics are reused as a valuable resource in the development of other products, reducing their environmental impact and looking for new product design advances that allow plastic to be reused. To this end, a couple of years ago when we announced this, we said that Interpipeline is contributing $10 million over 10 years to applied research with Nate to look at ways to reduce plastic from entering the environment and also for removing plastic waste, which is already in the environment. This contribution is part of a commitment that Interpipeline made to the Federal Strat Strategic Innovation Fund. We have undertaken this initiative because we believe that plastic is a valuable commodity that belongs in the economy and not the environment. It's important that as a society, we get plastics right. When plastic products complete their usefulness, they don't belong in landfills or the environment, and they should be considered a valuable resource that can be recycled and reused. When a plastic product continues to be reused or recycled and enters the production cycle again and again, this is known as a circular economy. At Interpipeline, this partnership with Nate and other initiatives that we're involved in are looking at ways to contribute to a tangible, applicable solutions and contribute to the creation of a circular economy. You know, we take great pride in the fact that we are developing and are near to completion of North America's first integrated propane to polypropylene complex right here in the heartland of Alberta. It's called the Heartland Petrochemical Complex. Being a safe and responsible operator and producer of quality recyclable plastic is something that Interpipeline intends to be proud of as well. We are proponents of the circular economy. We're members of the Chemistry Industry Association of Canada's UN recognized responsible care program. We're members of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, members of the Alberta Plastics Recycling Association, and founding members of the Plastics Alliance of Alberta. We support these and other initiatives, including PREA, and today you will hear about that one. We're excited to be working in partnership with Nate, a world leading polytechnic dedicated to helping industry develop practical, impactful solutions to address their specific needs and challenges. So about PREA, the acronym for Plastics Research in Action. We are here today to tell you that this partnership has embarked on some exciting work over the last couple of years to keep plastic out of the environment. Today you'll hear updates on the two, a uh, couple of the main initiatives we started on originally. One focuses on the study of microplastics in water and the other seeks to find ways to use hard to recycle plastics and other products like building products, starting with asphalt. You'll also hear about other building products and about our participation in research to understand the post-consumer plastics supply chain and market so that businesses can start up with knowledge of that market. And very importantly, you'll learn about how we're engaging and also learning from our young people and students. For the great ideas, for sustainable ideas, working with students is a big part of this partnership. This kind of work cannot occur in a vacuum. Our governments, our academic institutions, industrial and community neighbors and partners are all, and all should be, engaged to make sure we all share in the findings and successes. We hope things that we learn here can be shared with others in other jurisdictions and around the world, and you'll hear more about that. Before we welcome our first speaker today, I want to draw your attention to the web page that we launched um, in the first year, and it's still up where you can visit for updates over the coming years. It's www.nate.ca and then slash Priya. And you can also visit interpipeline.com or follow Nate and Interpipeline on Twitter for ongoing updates about Priya or the Heartland Petrochemical Complex, as well as other related news and notes. 
Um, Jen, I would like to put up the slide for the forward-looking statement. Um, before we begin the formal presentation, if I can draw your attention to that statement, essentially what it says is that I would like you all to be aware that the information on this conference call may contain forward-looking information and assumptions. And although they're considered reasonable by PREA partners at this time, they may later differ from those stated or implied by our comments today. And undue reliance should not be placed on this information. But without that out of the way, let's get to the fun stuff. Today, you're going to be hearing from the following people. Laura Jo Gunter, who is the NAIT president and CEO, will kick us off. Jeremiah Brixaw, chemist of the Clean Technologies team at NAIT. Dr. Toya Oyden, NAIT senior project manager for PRIA. Dr. Paolo Massoni, the Applied Research Chair in Energy at NAIT. Dan Morrison, Sustainability Supervisor, Interpipeline. Nadia Leenders, NAIT Student Research Assistant. I'm also, if we're on to the logos slide now, I'm also excited to confirm that in uh, the spirit of collaboration I was just talking about, we have some continuing and some new partners involved in this research. You'll hear more in the presentations to come, but we're excited to be working with Dow Canada, Green Mantra Technologies, the counties of Strathcona and Sturgeon, both from Alberta's industrial heartland, as well as new partners, McAsphalt and Polyco. We're thrilled with the energy and alignment these partners are bringing to the partnership and look forward to the work ahead. So let's get started. Uh, we've said it many times before, but working with Nate is incredibly important and valuable to us. Interpipeline's commitment to environment and sustainability goes hand in hand with our commitment to communities and young people and creating opportunities in the communities that we operate and develop in. Nate is an aligned and obvious partner. We're pleased to be able to have the president and CEO of Nate with us. And at this time, we'd like to ask Laura Jo Gunter to say a few words. Over to you, Laura Jo. Thank you, Lorraine. I'm so excited to be here um, and to uh, talk to this group today um, regarding this very exciting um, opportunity with Priya. And um, we're very excited to be here because it's such an important part of what we do at Nate is partnering with um, institutions, I mean, sorry, with industry in order to solve um, uh, industry's most pressing problems. Plastics is a problem that affects us all. And addressing that problem is what really excites me about this partnership with Interpipeline and the work that we are doing together through the Plastics Research in Action. The potential global impact for these projects is astounding. The projects that we are talking about today are not only exciting, but so necessary because of their possible implications. From identifying and quantifying microplastics in the North Saskatchewan River, to blending plastic into asphalt for use in cold climates, to turning plastics into luxury flooring, to researching plastic waste, all of these have promising, promising benefits that go way beyond Alberta. And let me just add that regarding the North Saskatchewan River project, I understand that some congratulations are in order for the project lead, Dr. Paolo Moussene. He recently was the recipient of the Dow Canada West Tech Award for Distinguished Leadership Leader um, in Science and Technology. So congratulations, Paolo, on your success. And we are so proud of you and to have you on this project. Recently, Nate launched a new strategic plan. It's called the Nate Effect, and it's all about impact. Priya brings together so many elements of this plan in terms of the direction that we at Nate want to go. Nearly all the planned strategic imperatives are reflected in the PREA projects. Our goals include increasing work integrated learning, strengthening our commitment to sustainability, bolstering our relationship and partnerships with industry and putting innovation to work, plus building powerful networks and providing the best learning environment for our students. It's basically a checklist for all the things that we accomplish with this partnership. And as you hear about the projects today, I hope you'll see how each of them furthers these goals. I'm particularly proud of how these projects work, um, involve our students. Getting them out into the field, doing that hands-on work, getting relative, relevant industry experience that sets them up for meaningful careers, 
To me, that's what a good polytechnic education is all about. So let me finish by saying thank you to Interpipeline for choosing Nate as your partner on this initiative. Nate is so proud of our collaboration and I'm so excited to hear more about these projects. Thank you. Thanks, Laura Jo. That was wonderful. We're very encouraged by the energy and alignment that Nate brings to this partnership and all the expertise and the students involved. It is exactly, it's a checkbox for us too, is exactly how we'd like to execute this project, these projects. Um, now we're gonna hear about the results of those efforts next and listen to each of the research experts outline the projects to you. But first we're gonna show you a quick video to show, show some, I uh, can't speak, show some footage from the microplastics in water project. If you could roll the video. We've been executing this project for 18 months now. We started with uh, nothing in the lab. At this point, we've developed a full suite of methodologies that allow us to sample efficiently in the field and extract the microplastics when we bring those samples back into the lab. Moving forward, we'll be analyzing what is today the largest collection of freshwater and sediment samples collected in Western Canada. And so we look forward to sharing the data that we'll be generating through the winter. What I think is the most unique aspect of this project is that we are combining three separate lines of applied research in microplastic science into one single project. We are using state-of-the-art equipment in collaboration with Dow Canada. They are leaders in analytical chemistry across the world, and uh, through their partnership, we have been able to push uh, microplastic science further and, and faster than we could have been on our own. We are also developing methodologies together and this is important for the science community at large. This is a very challenging project because it involves very long days into the field and uh, it requires skills, including a high level of training and safety to be able to operate in the field at this scale. And it's also very challenging because the methodologies that are involved in terms of preparation in the lab are non-standard. And so we've had to put a lot of time, several months into really understanding and figuring out how to control contamination in the lab and how to become efficient at doing the work that we need to do to extract the microplastics. That, but that's not all of it. The identification and the quantification of the microplastics is something that's a deep challenge in its own right. The most important thing that allowed us to make progress is that we brought a community together. Without all of these elements together, progress would have been not only a lot slower, but probably impossible in some of these areas. Teamwork is, is, is really the magic that makes all of this work happen. Without a strong, cohesive team, without a team that loves what they do and is able to uh, take on challenges that sometimes are quite uh, significant, both in the field and in the lab, uh, this work wouldn't happen. For me, like microplastics is a topic that gets a lot of media coverage. Like People talk about it a lot. It's a very uh, growing concern for a lot of people. So being in the middle of that research is very interesting and getting to see what actually happens behind the research is exciting. I would say that my favorite experience has actually been the field work, like going down to the river and collecting the samples. Sometimes it's been very exhausting. The river is often very cold, but the process of doing that has been very fun. Working on this project, I learned really a lot. It's been an eye opener to me uh, in understanding the, the deep implications of having uh, an important material like plastics in our everyday life. I think I'm back on. Um, that was great. There was a lot of work done out there this summer and the summer before. And I would like now to introduce Jeremiah Brixa chemist with the Clean Technologies team at Nate. Jeremiah will talk about the microplastics in water project and where we are today. I wanna to maybe just at this point quickly say that there will be opportunities after the presentations to ask questions. And there is a ask a question button on your uh, screens, uh, but we will save all the questions to the end after everyone does the presentations. Thanks, Jeremiah, go right ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremiah. I'm going to give some updates on the microplastic project uh, studying in the North Saskatchewan River. 
So there's no shortage of news articles um, talking about microplastics in recent times. Essentially, everywhere scientists look, they're finding these small mi microscopic plastic particles in the environment. It started off in the ocean, but they're turning up in rivers, lakes, sediments, soils, in the atmosphere, and in many biological organisms, including humans. So it's an emerging field of science, and it's a topic, a, a hot button topic. Um, the federal government uh, recently published a few documents relating to microplastics and plastics in the environment. One of them I'll reference is Canada's Plastic Science Agenda. And it's a good overview of some of the science that's been taking place uh, within Canada, but it highlights some, some key knowledge gaps that exist in the, in the science. So it's important for us as researchers to keep these in mind. One of them um, in particular is the, um, the lack of standardized methods um, to sample and detect microplastics in the environment. So more on that in the next couple slides. In collaboration with Interpipeline and Dow, um, we've been studying microplastics in the North Saskatchewan River in the Edmonton Municipal Region. Um, this segment of the river is a highly urbanized uh, segment, and there's not very much data available on it uh, to date. So we're hoping to answer a few of these questions as well. We want to um, develop these methods and hopefully advance the science, uh, the microplastic science and the, the need to standardize um, some of these methods. The first year of the project was really all about learning about the ropes about, about working with microplastics. Um, it was a steep learning curve for us, but we, we made it through the year. And the second year is all about optimizing and fine tuning these methods and applying them to our work. Um, in the lab, we've been working really closely with Dr. Jim Luong and his team of chemists at the Dow Fort Saskatchewan site, helping to optimize some of these methods to extract, isolate, and clean up microplastics from the North Saskatchewan River. Um, there's a lot of challenges working with these small invisible particles, so um, we really want our methods to be reliable and robust um, when we apply them to the samples we collect and to produce reliable results. Um, as well, we want to minimize our lab contamination. Anyone working with microplastics understands the need um, to, ha to, under to um, address the contamination um, from various sources. Microplastics are everywhere. They're in the chemicals you buy, they're in um, the atmosphere, and they're all over uh, all the users in the lab as well as um, the field. So it's important to, to address these and to understand um, the lab contamination. So we applied strict quality control procedures to enable us to get uh, the best results we can. In the field, it was really exciting for us this year. Uh, we designed and, de and optimized um, a prototype sampling system to enable us to sample the North Saskatchewan River effectively for microplastics. A lot of the research that's taken place um, is in the ocean and applying these techniques to sample in the ocean in the North Saskatchewan River um, is, is quite challenging. They don't, they don't necessarily work as, as they should. Um, and this is due to the fact that the North Saskatchewan has a high flow rate, particularly in the spring months, and it has a high suspended solid load throughout the summer. So these are challenging um, issues um, that we have to overcome. ASDM, who's involved in standardizing methodology, um, published a document um, in, uh, in August 2020. So we were, we were able to develop a prototype sampling system um, to conform to this method uh, for sampling microplastics. Um, we developed something that's plastic free, battery powered and small enough to fit in backpacks. So it enables us to travel throughout the river valley and sample pretty much anywhere we want, um, regardless of infrastructure um, at the sites. All we need is solid ground to stand on. So we believe we generated one of the largest um, collections of, of freshwater and sediment samples um, in Western Canada using standardized methodology this field season. Um, we trained two summer students, John Wong and Nadia Lingers, who you hear from later on in this presentation. And as well, we, we were able to present um, our initial work at the Remediation Technology Symposium um, this fall to environmental consultants and scientists um, about our work that we've been doing so far. Looking forward into uh, the next steps, we're going to be um, processing all the, sample, all the samples that we collected this, this field season using our optimized methods and in light of our quality control procedures we have in place. We'll be training um, additional summer students starting uh, in January. We'll be out next year in the field um, sampling microplastics in the North Saskatchewan River. And we're really excited about this. We're actually um, going to be presenting at an ASTM microplastic symposium um, in the summer of 2022 to talk about some of the work that we did while developing our prototype sampling system. 
So thank you all for listening. I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Dessa Odoyan, who is the Senior Project Manager for PRIA, and he's going to talk about plastics in asphalt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremiah. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Adetu Isho Yudun. I'm the Senior Project Manager for PRIA, and I'm going to give a brief update about the progress on the asphalt project. The title of the project is the development and demonstration of novel recycled plastic modified asphalt for better climatic conditions. In terms of the purpose of the project, the main purpose of this project is to test, to validate, and to demonstrate the blending of post-consumer plastics into asphalt for better cold climate conditions. And in terms of timeline, the project consists of three phases over approximately two and a half years. We started this project in June 2021, and the phase one of the project deals with the identification of suitable waxes for blending with Abata asphalt samples. We've actually completed this phase. Phase two of the project is the testing and confirmation that the modified asphalt product meets the testing requirements for Abata roadways and climate conditions. This phase is ongoing. We started this phase August 2021, and it's ongoing. The phase three of the project will deal with the feed demonstration and the monitoring of the, pro of the, uh, of the, of the laid down asphalt in the feed. We hope to start this immediately, the weather permits around uh, early May 2021 next year. So for the partners, we can't do this without the, all the partners in the project. So for this project, we will be an opportunity to work with the following partners. Green Mantra Technologies. Green Mantra is a clean technology leader that uses its advanced chemical recycling technology to transform waste plastics into value-creating synthetic waxes and polymer additives. So in terms of what Green Mantra brings on the table, they are committed to cost-effective transformation of plastic waste into valuable products. And in this project, they, have, they brought in their staff expertise, the use of their proprietary technology for blending with asphalt and testing the recycled modified asphalt samples. In terms of the asphalt company, we've been opportunity to work with Mark Ashford Industry Limited, which is a diversified Canadian company committed to development, production, distribution and marketing of asphaltic products, including asphalt-related services and technology. For this project, they brought, they provide the asphalt that we're using for this project in phase one and currently in phase two. They are also doing the material and internal testing of the asphalt mixtures. They brought in their staff expertise for blending the recycled asphalt, uh, plastics with asphalt and testing the asphalt mixtures to meet the requirement for Abata roadways and climate conditions. Lastly, we are also opportunity to work with Strathcona County and Sturgeon counties. They are both counties that are located in Alberta Industrial Atlant, the Canada largest petrochemical and hydrocarbon processing center. In this project, two counties, they provide testing sites for later in this project and serve as project advisors to provide municipal perspectives to this project. Progress to date, we've completed phase one of the project and it was led by Green Mantra. Two binders were modified with two different Green Mantra polyethylene wax products. The binders were characterized by softening point, penetration and viscosity to determine the recommended binders and the dosage for the project going forward. We step into phase 2A of the project. And in the phase 2A of the project, we completed the super paved performance grading test, the stability test, and other essential tests to evaluate the chosen binders sent in by Green Mantra. The testing so far determined that the binder is good, the storage stability is fine, and no red flags are noticed. The binder performs significantly well compared to other polymers currently used in the industry to modify asphalt. Also, we've confirmed and we've, uh, with Bonco Rocks as the aggregate suppliers for this project. So 
in terms of next step, and probably before touching on the next step, I just want to highlight that one of the things that excites me about this project is the project has great potential to redirect large amount of plastics into other use, and it's great impact for municipalities, and we're also bringing together the right partners. So in terms of next steps, we're hoping to complete the phase 2B of the project, which is the optimization and the verification of the performance of the opt missed asphalt. We are also going to commence phase three, field testing of the asphalt in hopefully by May 2022. At least four sites have been identified to date. Then we're going to be doing the field demonstration and the testing. And with this, I would like to pass it on to Dr. Paolo Messoni, who will provide update on the development of polypropylene flooring from recycled materials. Paolo. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Paolo Mussone, Oventive Applied Research Chair in Energy at Nate. I'm really excited to be here with you today and to talk about a new project in the Plastics Research in Action portfolio. Uh, this is a project that will look at developing polypropylene-based flooring uh, and also include recycled materials into that flooring product. Currently, the vast majority of luxury, luxury vinyl flooring uh, is actually imported in North America. This project, these products are manufactured using polyvinyl chloride. This is a plastic that does not degrade. It's very hard to recycle. And so most of it is currently ending in the landfill at the end of the life cycle. That's, that's a serious problem. And uh, we're very thankful to be able to work with a Calgary-based company, Polyco, which is developing a luxury flooring product that's based off of polypropylene. They plan to manufacture this product, product using polypropylene that will be produced at the Heartland Petrochemical Complex. And the important thing about this product is that it's fully recyclable because polypropylene, unlike PVC, can in fact be recycled and there are no off gases given off from the processing of this particular type of polymer. In this project, we're going to look at introducing 20% recyclable content into the initial prototype that Polyco will make. And of course, this will have a massive impact down the road in terms of uh, reducing landfilling. The testing that will be conducted at Nate uh, is really designed to validate the product. And this includes, as I mentioned, uh, adding recycl recyclable content into the initial prototype. And this is with really a, a line of sight towards commercialization and achieving uh, certification from the American Society of Testing Materials. This testing that we're going to conduct at Nate will include chemical, thermal, as well as mechanical performance properties testing that will help Polyco move the commercialization of their product forward. I'm really excited about this project because the volumes of non-recyclable uh, luxury vinyl flooring currently imported in North America and in Canada, of course, are very large. So this project has a very significant potential to make measurable contributions to not only reducing landfilling practices, but also in adding uh, to the circular economy in our province. In addition to that, uh, Scaling up of the production at Polyco will also uh, expand on the downstream manufacturing opportunities that HPC brings to life. And of course, alongside with that, enhance local employment. And last but not least, and this is dear and near to my heart, uh, additional opportunities for hands-on training for our students at Nate. So thank you to Plastics Research in Action and to Polyco for this project. And I look forward to following up with you in the coming months, the project started on November 1st, so we don't have the results yet. Uh, but in the coming months, we'll be very happy to report on the progress. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, I would like to hand over to Dan Morrison, Supervisor, uh, Sustainability at Interpipeline. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Musoni. Um, I'm excited to uh, provide an update on uh, a data project that we have partnered with through PREA and uh, the Alberta Plastics Recycling Association. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, plastic use and management has become an increasingly important topic on the agenda of many public and private organizations as they look for ways to reduce and recycle plastic materials. In Alberta, we do not have a good understanding of how much post-use plastic is being generated, where this generation occurs, or what types of plastic feedstocks exist. The first step of good management is good measurement. We need the data to understand the regional supply and demand picture for post-use plastics. This knowledge allows industry, policymakers, and municipalities the opportunity to identify where to expand existing recycling infrastructure, identify new opportunities for investment, and further evaluate what types of plastic feedstock can be utilized into higher value consumer products or other materials. This understanding can lead to uh, diversification in all areas of circularity. PREA is supporting the data project focused in the Alberta Industrial Heartland region, northeast of Edmonton, uh, led by Unomia, an international waste auditing expert consultancy for the Alberta Plastics Recycling Association, to develop a methodology to quantitatively and qualitatively assess plastic waste at various uh, industrial operations. This data will provide industry and waste organizations an understanding of the volumes and types of post-use plastic available. And this data can then be used to help better design the current processes from a linear take, make, dispose model into a circular economy where products are used to their highest value. This will also help build the understanding of plastic feedstock and volumes from the industrial sector to drive economies of scale and capital investment in Alberta. This project will identify diversion opportunities to reduce landfill rates of plastics. And finally, this will identify a baseline for collaboration opportunities between industry, academia, government, and local associations. This project is one of 14 selected from across Canada to receive funding under the Zero Plastic Waste Initiative by the Environment and Climate Change Canada. Outcomes to date, uh, we have uh, conducted 39 detailed waste audits completed across 10 companies in the industrial heartland. Uh, currently, the data is being analyzed, though it is uh, too early to share the results. Uh, they are still in draft form and they are still being analyzed. Final report is expected in uh, February and we're excited to bring these results to the, to the public. Um, this uh, methodology that is developed will hopefully be um, available for use in other jurisdictions across Alberta and then uh, potentially even across Canada. This will also help provide decision makers with the data and methodology for policy and projects. And with that, thank you very much. And I will pass it back to Lorraine Ryer. All right. That was an awful lot of information. And it was great. You know that you will have an opportunity to ask some questions afterwards, and we can have a bit more of a conversation. Right now, I'm going to um, introduce uh, Nadia Linders, who is a student research assistant with the Clean Technologies team. I also want to acknowledge that we've had a number of um, students work in this program and will continue to. Uh, I think since the beginning of the project, there's been uh, 16 students. Um, I think Toyo knows the number of hours, but lots of opportunity. Uh, John Wong is uh, another student on the microplastics project. Um, and uh, he's been working in this field of the, the microplastics that we've been working on uh, with Dow in his field of choice, chemical analysis and Priya funding and this these project provided him with the opportunity to practice and expand his knowledge and uh, uh, he acquired uh, graduating last May from Nate in the chemical technology program. Nadia brings a whole bunch more passion to the to the uh, to the field and to these projects and I'd love to hear from you now Nadia to talk to you about um, what this has done for you and what you're interested in doing. Thanks Nadia. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, good morning, everyone. I am Nadia Leenders, a summer student working on the microplastics and water project under Jeremiah Brixa. I've been a part of the project as of May 2021 and am a recent graduate from McEwen University with a Bachelor of Science degree, majoring in molecular biology and minoring in chemistry. I applied to be a student researcher because I wanted to get as much work experience as I could before I graduated from university. It was through my work integrated learning course at McEwen that I was able to find this job. My professors were able to support and guide me all through the application process. I was interested in this job because it gave the opportunity to accumulate a variety of skills and experience in both field work and lab work. 
Microplastics is also a very new and emerging research topic. The idea that I get to be a part of a research project in its earliest stages is very exciting to me. Through this position, I have gained experience working with certain instruments that I didn't get the opportunity to through my schooling. I also learned a lot about proper field sampling. Plastic is everywhere, so I had to learn to be more mindful of contamination from both the workspace and equipment that I'm using down to the clothes that I'm wearing. It has been an exercise in patience and really forced me to think critically about every step of the process to avoid contamination. The most valuable skill that I will take away from this job though is probably going to be the ability to troubleshoot and learning about the ups and downs of method development. Especially when working in the field, I, if something went wrong with our equipment, we needed to be able to deal with it in the moment, often with limited resources to fix the problem. Collecting just one sample took so long due to the volume of water we needed. Everything we did required efficiency, so or we wouldn't be able to collect from all the sites that we needed to in one day. The skills that I gained to deal with these problems and learning how to optimize our process I feel is invaluable. They are lessons that I can take and apply anywhere in my future. Thank you. Nadia, that was great. Thanks. Um, I think we could all learn uh, patience, but the, as I listen to you guys talk about the things you have to do to make sure these are verifiable, repeatable, valid um, samples and methods, um, I'm so appreciative of what the uh, what these projects are doing to contribute to the body of knowledge, not just here, but globally. Um, in these important areas. And we're so pleased to have your energy and your passion brought to the projects. Thank you very much. Um, so at this point in the presentation, we just want to point out that there will always be, not always, often be opportunities for collaboration on future applied research projects focused on the reuse and the recycling of plastics. If you or your organization as you're listening are interested and have a good idea, please visit the Plastics Research in Action webpage for contact information regarding future opportunities. Um, we, uh, we wanna make sure we give a special thanks to all of our industry and municipal partners who have joined us in this very exciting next phase. I'm looking forward to Toya out there personally laying down asphalt next spring <laughs> in our test sites. Um, he mentioned the municipalities. We're also gonna have a test site right on our own Hetra Heartland Petrochemical Complex site. It'll be laid by Alexander Paving from the Alexander First Nation. They're also going to have a test site. And uh, of course, there's lots more progress being made over the winter and into next summer on the microplastic study. It's our intention to make as much of our learnings and the study that Dan talked about too, is going to be available for the, the body of scientists and interested people working on these topics available for use. So, that's what we're trying to do here is make some advances that are practical, applicable, and start getting plastics out of the environment right away. Um, so now that we have some experience under our belts, we look forward to having more news to share, and we'll post updates on our website and our social media going forward. We are now going to open the floor for questions. And this is how it'll work. Please submit your questions on the... Uh, uh, submit a question button that's on your screen. I don't see the same screen as you do, but I, I believe it's obvious. Um, we will get to as many questions as possible in the allotted time. If we can't get to all of them, we'll take a note and we'll try to respond best we can. For any media that are on the call, we are pleased to take your questions now, but if you have more than one or two, we'll be happy to connect you after the call with either the inner pipeline or the Nate uh, media relations teams. Um, and then I think that's it for housekeeping. As the questions are coming in, I'm gonna use the power of the moderator's chair to ask the first question. And uh, Paolo or Jeremiah can take this one, but you mentioned ASTM, and I know that I had to learn what ASTM was, but I think I was impressed with the significance. Um, what this body is, who this body is, what they do, and why is it so important that uh, that they're paying attention and that we're making a presentation to this body next June? Jeremiah, would you like to take that since um, you spent so many hours 
in the field and uh, and actually working with the system and submitting the abstract to ASDM? Sure, thanks, Paolo. So ASDM stands for the American Society Society for Testing and Materials, and they're a body that really publish um, standardized methodologies that anyone can use around the world in order to um, ensure that results kind of match from lab to lab. Um, so it really helps us out in the microplastic space um, because the science is so new. We want to be able to have results that can be used from other research groups and to help, it, to help advance the science. Um, so we're really looking forward to presenting at, at the ASDM conference and a lot of the things that we learned. Um, microplastic work is very challenging and there's a lot of things that you you need to, to you need your basis to cover before before you start to produce good results. So we're happy to share a lot of the learnings that we had. So some of the things that we think were good and some of the things that we know um, are challenging and it'd be nice to know ahead of time before, before we learned the hard way kind of thing. So uh, we're really looking forward to present our work to two fellow scientists and the committee there and maybe, um, maybe even affect the ASTM um, going forward if there's a new uh, publication on it. Thank you. Lorraine, if you're okay, I'll add a couple of comments to those great comments from Jeremiah. Uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, is watching what we're doing with great interest because the work that we're doing in influencing methods for collection and analysis uh, is going to be at some point in the not too far distant future part of the science that will inform a standard on how all of this work is going to be done. So from a regulatory perspective, uh, what Plastics Research in Action is doing through this project is contributing and being active in that, uh, in that conversation, as opposed to being simply a recipient of a guideline that will come down at some point from the government. This is, this is a very important part uh, of the work that is happening uh, through PRIA. Right, and I think I really appreciate it because you know, you'll have people say there is this much plastic in this body of water or that much or whatever. And if there is no standardized testing, exactly. we're talking about apples and oranges, right? So we, we, as a we as a global community need to be able to have some faith and certainty in those numbers. And so standardized testing is incredibly important. Hmm? Good. Um, a, a really simple one. What is the size range of microplastics is the next question. Sure, I'll, I'll take that one actually. So the upper size range of a, of a microplastic is five millimeters. The lower size range is around 100 nanometers. Um, we've been working with our method, um, focusing on the size, the small size classes, because that's where we think the future of the, the field of science will go. So really dialing in and uh, less than 500 microns uh, down to 100 microns is where we know we're really accurate and we wanna push the method to be sub 100 microns actually, which is quite challenging. Because you're telling me I can't see 100 microns. You can't even see it if you know where to look. <laughs> your, your, your hair is, uh, is about 75 microns or so in diameter. So as soon as you go below that, uh, for plastics that have no color or dye in them, you won't be able to see them. So mm -hmm. extracting them from any kind of matrix, whether it's water or sediments, it's extraordinarily complicated. Uh, th th this is why there's so much uncertainty in the science, because it's hard to see them when right. they're that small. And handle them and measure them, I would imagine. And count them, yes. Um, there's another question that says, uh, Toya, this could be you. Uh, any plan for distance learning online education open to international students for experiential education, experiential learning in healthcare as well, dot, dot, dot. So what about okay. distance learning? Yeah, so one of the things that uh, we... Working with Nate actually brought on the table is because based on all the work that we're doing, we mm -hmm. have a very good uh, continuing education center at, at Nate that we can mm -hmm. use to come up with uh, you know different modules and different courses on what we've learned so far. So we've put the process in place. We're we're currently working on that behind uh, the scene to see you know what are the pro what are these courses that we can bring up now and how you know in what form to do that. So. I'll just advise the person that has a question to, you know, to look forward to updates, especially and maybe sign up for updates on our website at nate.ca slash prayer. We're going to post uh, updates on that, but we're working on it and to understand what perspective we want to cover and the courses that we want to cover. Thank you. 
Great. The next question I can take, it says, what is the PREA connection to the Heartland Petrochemical Complex exactly? And I guess uh, it started with, uh, so Interpipeline is building the Heartland Petrochemical Complex. We will be the, uh, the complex will be the first integrated propane to polypropylene uh, complex in North America. We'll be producing polypropylene. Uh, as such, uh, and in everything we do, we want to make sure that we're a responsible operator, we're getting into the issues that surround anything that we do. And um, also as part of a commitment to the federal government when we were uh, going through a SIF grant application, we determined that we would give Interpipeline is contributing $10 million over 10 years to looking at um, solutions for uh, getting plastics out of the environment or keeping plastics out of the environment. And so that's it. As an owner of the Heartland Petrochemical Complex, Inner Pipeline is undertaking this important work. Um, and I think, I hope that answers your question. It says, what is the most common type of microplastic encountered in the North Saskatchewan River? And they have here LDPE, HDPE, PP. Someone who has a better chemistry vocabulary than me. So what is the most common type so far? Uh, so we weren't going to talk about the results exactly today, but there have been uh, one published study that shows that there are a variety of microplastics um, in the North Saskatchewan River from polypropylene, uh, polyethylene, and a lot of um, PET fibers, so synthetic fibers from polyester. Um, so there's a, likely a variety of plastics um, within the North Saskatchewan River. And when we're uh, finished with the data, we'll definitely be sharing it uh, publicly for everyone. Perfect. Thanks. Ongoing, right? Uh, what is the timeline for laying the uh, plastic slash asphalt blend down on the road? And actually, Toya, when you do this, can you talk a little bit about, because one of the questions I was actually going to ask was, are you not worried about plastic particles shedding off the asphalt road? And you should speak a little bit about the green mantra process. But also, will there be uh, asphalt laid down in time for uh, testing this winter is the question. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, so... Uh, like I said in the update, we're, we're looking at having the asphalt laid down anytime uh, around April ending, but likely first week of May. So we're looking at when we'll be able to kind of have access to the ground, snow is off the ground. So we're not going to lay down asphalt on or before, you know, we have this uh, winter gone. We're going to have it laid down in early spring, which is uh, around ending of April to early May. That's when we're looking at. And in terms of regards to you know plastic coming out or leaching out of the asphalt, one of the reasons why we're going with Green Mantra is uh, Green Mantra technology actually have a chemistry to convert the plastic into waxes. So the chemistry has changed and thereby well, to waxes that are very close in property, polymer property, similar to what we have in asphalt. So, any concern will be similar to that of traditional asphalt. So, and also we are in the early stage of two and a half year project. So fit test we will be conducted later in the project and monitor to ensure that the project is safe, benchmark against current product. Okay, perfect. Um, there's a question here to elaborate about uh, what I mentioned about Alexander Paving, the Alexander First Nation. So um, can you elaborate on the partnership with? So not exactly a partnership, but right now we're certainly working with them to supply um, a test site and, and their paving company to do paving for us at Heartland. Um, we have uh, business relationships with Alexander um, in, in other ways and in, in other First Nations in other ways. But this one is just, they're gonna do some paving for us at the uh, HPC site and they're gonna use one of their own sites for testing as well. What we were looking for and why this wasn't more widespread to other places is because we, this is just testing, remember. Right now, asphalt's still on the bench in the lab <laughs> and and we're, we need some place where the aggregate is close and the test sites are close and we're trying to keep it all together while we're doing a test. Clearly, if we meet some success on tests, we'll expand that. But right now, it's just a local small testing kind of a, an exercise. Um, and it says, can you talk a bit about practical outcomes? Suppose you find a way to measure and describe the microplastics in the river. Then what? I don't that's know. Howard, do you have an answer? Oh, that, that's a potentially a million-dollar question. Uh, it, it's very important that we know 
uh, which microplastics are where, because they will likely be correlated with inputs into the river. And so through this work, we will be able to work with whoever, let me say, owns those inputs to inform how their operations could be improved so that the release of microplastics, if it's there, uh, can be controlled and reduced, reduced, ideally eliminated. So it, it's really about generating knowledge that um, helps whoever is contributing into the, into the release of microplastics into the North Saskatchewan uh, do things better. Uh, mm -hmm. Not finger pointing anybody. Uh, we, we're laying the, that kind of ground science work that would help everybody uh, behave better and perform better and operate better around our river system. Yeah. Um, so really, baseline, find out where is what is where, and all of us get better information. Um, we have a phase two of our microplastic project that's also going to talk about and, and examine uh, instrumentation to measure uh, process flow and so on, so on and so forth. So these are all iterative contributing research projects, would you say, Paolo? Uh, absolutely. The, the baseline, as you called it, Lorraine, is really the, uh, if you're building a house, almost like the foundation for what we know. And then on top of that foundation, we're building through another project, in, project inside Plastics Research in Action, a monitoring uh, tool that will enable everybody that wants to track particular type of plastics in the environment. And then the next stage of that will be developing solutions to retain microplastics before they even enter into the environment. Laying the foundations is critical because if you, we don't know what's there and uh, at what time and at what rates, we won't really be able to design the solutions that will come uh, later down the road. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. A uh, couple questions on whether this is being recorded and will be available for later, and the answer is yes. So you can let your colleagues know if they weren't able to join today. Um, what has been the team's experience working with Strathcona County and Sturgeon County on these projects? That's an interesting question, but I would say all good. But Toya, that's your job right there. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I really want to appreciate the uh, the representative of uh, Strathcona and Sturgeon on the call. We've, we've had several meetings generally once a month. And they've provided perspective, especially on the types of Ashford, you know, the right mix and you know, for each of the counties, because as we know, different jurisdictions have different mixes with Ashford. So they've mm -hmm. been able to work with us and work directly with um, Ashford as well as Green Mantra in looking at, okay, this is the right mix of what we're looking for. This is the combination of what works for you know, our counties. Then looking holistically in terms of combining that of Strathcona and uh, Sturgeon, and then based on the binders that we, we've identified earlier. So I would say all good, and they've been contributing greatly. So we look forward to laying down the ice spot next spring. There's a good follow-up to that question, Toya, and it is where are you looking at the test sites? Are you looking at highway use or urban areas? So we're looking at a blend of, you know, both. So, and we've been in discussion with the counties to identify we want areas, we just don't want to look at, you know, rural area alone. We want areas that has high use and we want areas that are also, you know, a blend of both industrial use. So we are in discussion with them. I know some sites have been identified earlier, but we're still, as we get closer to when we want to lay down the asphalt, we're going to zero in on a specific site based on all the indicators that we've identified earlier. Uh, another question says, as a consumer, what can you do to be more conscious about microplastics? And as researchers, what have you learned about microplastic contamination that can be applied to everyday life? We have a very engaged and uh, challenging audience. I love that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll take a first crack at it, Lorraine, and then I'll, uh, I'll ask Jeremiah to chip in as well. Um, please recycle, 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 keep very valuable carbon in our economy. Uh, don't discard, use and lobby if you don't have a recycling program in your community, lobby with your community so that a recycling program is put in place. Uh, plastics are too valuable to be let go into the, into the landfill. There's too many things that we can do with them. And uh, 
many valuable things that we can do with them. So let's not turn them into microplastics. Let's keep them in the economy. That's my, I, I tend to wear my heart on my sleeve. So that, that's my uh, call to action for everyone on the call today and their families. Yeah, I know for me, I've spent the last uh, year and a half studying microplastics just deep in the weeds. Uh, I haven't really had time to think about the implications and, and what to do as a society. But I, I agree with Paolo. I think recycling is, is one of the key, the key features that we're going to have to um, mm -hmm. investigate for sure. Thank you. I know that my learning uh, when we began these projects was that uh, when you wash your clothing, microplastics come off in the water and get discharged. Like there's... Um, and you were mentioning it earlier, Jeremiah, microplastics on, I think, or maybe it was Nadia on, uh, on your clothing in the air. You know, there's many places where microplastics exist. Uh, what this project is doing is trying to measure them in, in water, right. And the, and the sediment. Um, but there's a whole other body of study that we haven't taken on, which is, um, are they are they harmful at what point at what size in which in which area like there's there is a whole body there that still needs to be studied which is what i think powell referred to as we're starting with a foundation and there's still lots to be lots to be done um but yeah microplastics come from everywhere right would you agree paulo they they literally come from every from everywhere and uh uh, unfortunately, in in some ways, they don't really have a an identity card or a tag. We 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 don't really know where they come from. We know there's lots of uh, uh, polyester type materials uh, in in the environment, so presumably they come from the clothing that we wear, um, but we don't know. So the, the 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 that's where perhaps for in in terms of citizenship participation, the the biggest impact that we can all have is in making sure that what we control in our daily lives as far as plastic use is done responsibly and uh, with the utmost care. So let's let's keep that very valuable carbon in use uh, as opposed to being dispersed. And mm -hmm. as we push the science forward on um, uh, who contributes uh, to these types of inputs into our river specifically, uh, then we will be able to then work with uh, everyone involved uh, to limit that and reduce that, ideally eliminate that. Um, I am waiting for another uh, question, but while I do actually, Paolo, um, can I ask you a bit about Polyco? Because this is our newest project. And um, I know you you did a good job of kind of laying out what uh, what they're after, which is to see what recyclable content percentage they can put into their flooring and then see how much of a circular economy they can get going in terms of the flooring. But uh, characterize the market for me right now. There is no local production of this type of flooring, right? There, there's zero production of this type of flooring in uh, uh, Alberta or in Canada that I know of. And uh, I'm pretty confident in saying in North America overall, uh, the idea of using polypropylene as a replacement for, for polyvinyl chloride for this specific type of application is actually a technology that originated in Europe. Uh, there isn't anyone that's making that in North America yet. And if you talk about significance, um, what I heard from the company is that there's about 50 million, uh, uh, 50 million cubic meters of this type of material that enters our borders every year for applications. Right now, that equivalent volume is all in polyvinyl chloride, which is it, perhaps the most difficult plastic to do something with at the end of the life cycle. So I'm excited as a scientist and as a, as a citizen at the idea that we can have something that's on the other hand based off of polypropylene, which is the, one of the most easy, one of the easiest possible plastics to recycle that could potentially displace these very large volumes. And um, um, maybe I'm biased because the HPC will be built just outside of Edmonton where I live, but I, I really love the idea that that material will come out of uh, a place in our region. And so we'll be participating in creating that circular uh, virtuous cycle of recycling and, and use locally of plastic, as opposed to having to import from outside. Well said. Uh, it's 10 o'clock and we need to wrap up our call. Uh, there will be continued information. If you go to uh, nate.ca 
slash Priya. There's information on Priya on that site. Uh, we both, uh, Nate and IPL, regularly tweet out any news or advancements on this. Please feel free to contact us and uh, with any ideas or questions. Any questions that we haven't gotten to today, we'll endeavor to get to answer. But I really appreciate you all tuning in. I appreciate our experts for giving us some of their valuable time. Get back in the lab, you guys. And uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.